Hi there! Welcome back to Miss History. I'm Rhonda. This is where I talk about unsolved historical mysteries. And sometimes whether or not fairy tales are true. If that sounds like something you might like, then hey, hit the subscribe button. Enough about that! How are you? I haven't been here in a while. I know, I had a video last week that maybe some of you watched, maybe some of you didn't, because maybe you're not here for, you know, FabFitFun, makeup, whatever, skincare. You're here for this. You want to see Ms. History. And I am here for you. You, you, right there, on the other side of the screen. <laughs> Today, we are going to go to 1971 in Florida to discuss the Jane Doe who would become known as Little Miss Lake Panasofsky. I might have said that correctly. I might not have. So, 1971 Florida. Two young teenage boys are hitchhiking and they noticed something floating under a highway overpass in the shallows of Lake Panasofki in Sumter County. According to the boys, they were trying to hitchhike a ride to go to Mardi Gras. And so they're crossing the bridge and they happen to look down and notice a body. They would wave down a highway trooper to alert him of the discovery. And within an hour, investigators were already on the scene. They noticed her by looking over the highway overpass because she was wrapped in a blanket and one of her hands was draped over a root coming out of the shallow water of the lake, which sounds kind of creepy. What is that movie where she comes out of the water? She looks wet. Something about a well. The rain? I guess. So she's reaching out of the TV? Yeah, but still, that's what I kind of think of that. You know, it's like this hand coming out of the lake. For the grudge. I don't know. That one was I, pretty creepy, too. I never saw either like one of them. evil person. Never saw either one of them. Never saw them. Anyway, not the point. The body was decomposed, dressed in a green shirt, green plaid pants, and a green floral poncho hip for the time. There was a man-sized 36 belt around her neck indicating that she had been strangled, but there were no signs of sexual assault. She was wearing a white gold watch, a gold necklace, and there was a gold ring with a transparent stone on the left ring finger indicating that she may have been married. This would suggest to investigators that robbery was uh, probably not the motive for her death. There was no identification found on or near the body, and she would become a Jane Doe, and would later be nicknamed Little Miss Lake Panasofki, after the lake she was found near. And going forward, I'm just going to refer to her as Little Miss Lake P, because that is going to be far more simple for me. During a forensic examination of the body, it was determined that she was likely murdered at least 30 days prior to her discovery. And it was believed that she was Caucasian, somewhere between the ages of 17 and 24, no taller than five foot five, and may have weighed about 115 pounds. She had dark hair and it was believed that she may have had brown eyes. Her teeth showed extensive dental work, including crowns, caps, and silver fillings. But when compared to a national database of dental records, there was no match that could be found to help in the identity. It would be later noted, and I will get to that, that she had had surgery to stabilize her right ankle. But that still didn't help identify the woman. No one came forward to claim the woman's body. So she would be buried in an unmarked grave in the Oak Grove Cemetery in Wildwood. 
Jamie Adams would become sheriff in the 1980s and would obtain a court order to exhume the body. He was really driven to get the identity of the woman because this was someone's loved one and they must be missing their wife, fiance, daughter, right? It was during this exam when the ankle injury was noted and it would be learned that little Miss P had given birth to perhaps two children. And I guess my question would be how, I, I know with women with their pelvis, you know, they can tell whether or not a woman has given birth, but how can they tell that it's been multiple births? If you're a doctor, if you know this, let me know, because I don't know how they'd know that you had more than one. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> a sketch artist would draw a reconstruction of the victim's face and attempt to age regress her, sketching how she may have looked as a child. This sheriff would then send bulletins with the image to law enforcement agencies throughout the county in an attempt to gain leads on her identity. In 1992, the case would gain national attention when it appeared on Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Do you remember that show? Am I the only one that was creeped out by that guy's voice? He would come on. And and, and, and it was like his, his voice was really cool. But it was also kind of ominous. Yeah, Robert but Stack. You yeah. just, you knew the news was going to be bad. So, so bad when you heard his voice. <laughs> like, well, this isn't good. You know, one of those things that I stayed up and watched was Unsolved Mysteries. Anyway. In 2002, Bill Farmer would become the sheriff, and he was one of the homicide detectives that actually worked on the case originally in 1971, so I'm sure he took the case really, really quite personally. He would again have the body exhumed, and new sketches would be made. Sheriff Farmer would also bring in a forensic anthropologist with the University of South Florida to study the remains. One of the anthropologists would reach out to geologist George Kamenov, Kamenov this guy, to assist. <laughs> Anthropologists study the isotopes of certain elements and the mix of heavier and lighter atoms to learn the diet and travel of ancient humans. Interesting. George would use this technique in this case, specifically looking at her teeth and her hair. So what George would ascertain from the study of Little Miss P was that she was likely from Southeastern Europe due to the carbon isotopes in her hair showing a grain-based European diet at the tips and an American-based one at the roots, which would lead to the theory that she had likely come to Florida maybe 10 months prior to her death. So early on when Sheriff Adams was still the sheriff, he hired a private investigator to work alongside the investigators to help produce more leads. This investigation would initially focus on a suspect who had early on been arrested in the same vicinity as Miss P was found weeks prior to the discovery of her body. A report in the paper would state that the suspect was nearly run over one night by a sheriff's patrol car while he was trying to cross the median of the I-75 within a mile of where Miss P was eventually found. According to a police report, the man had a pistol in his possession at the time he was arrested. The private investigator would state that he believed the man's arrest fit within the timeline of the death of Miss P, but authorities didn't make the immediate connection. And by the time they did, the man was long gone, had never been seen again, and was therefore never questioned, which is really, really unfortunate. Nobody could really blame the police for not questioning the guy. I mean, I don't know how many weeks prior to the discovery of Little Miss P, but 
I, by the time they did put two and two together, he he was gone. So sucks, just sucks. But there have been several theories about who Miss P may have been in life. As I stated earlier, George, the name I can't pronounce, would study the carbon isotopes of her hair to determine that she was likely from southeastern Europe, specifically Greece. So one theory was that she had perhaps traveled to the U.S. to attend a Greek Orthodox celebration, Epiphany, which does tend to attract thousands of people specifically to the Tarpon Springs area. Is it possible that a killer may have been a member of the Greek community in nearby Clearwater, Tarpon Springs, or Newport Ritchie? Unfortunately, this would be an investigative dead end. Another theory was that she was perhaps in the U.S. as part of a student work exchange program. A woman came forward on a Greek crime show 41 years after the discovery, stating that one of the sketches of a younger Miss P resembled a girl she was childhood friends with by the name of Constantina. According to the woman, she and Constantina would attend a prep school in Greece together, and then each of them would join an exchange program upon graduation where they were required to work abroad to fulfill a two-year obligation for their education. So according to this woman, she got sent to Australia and her friend Constantina was sent to the U.S. They lost touch around the same time that Miss P was found in 1971. Unfortunately, authorities have never been able to confirm this woman's story nor reach any known relatives of Constantina. A final theory is that perhaps Miss P was the victim of serial killer Paul John Knowles. He was active in Florida in 1974 but he was on parole in the state in 1971. And who was Paul J. Knowles? A known serial killer that went by the Casanova Killer. And he is said to have murdered somewhere between 20 and 35 or even more people between June and November of 1974, spanning seven states. He was born in Orlando, Florida in 1946. He was raised in foster homes after his father gave him up for committing and being convicted of petty crimes. His first incarceration was at the age of 19 and he would spend time in prison in the following years. In early 1974, he was serving time at Rayfor Prison in Florida and he would begin correspondence with a woman in the San Francisco area who would then make the trip to Florida to visit him. He would propose to her upon her arrival and then they would become engaged and she would become instrumental in his release. Why do women fall in love with serial killers? They're not great. Anyway, he would get released. He would fly to California to go be with her. She apparently allegedly was warned by a psychic about the dangers of her new fiance. And so, you know, she dumped him like kind of like a hot potato which you know nothing says he's bad news like he's in prison it's alleged that Knowles would then murder three people in San Francisco the night that his fiance broke it off with him this has never been verified but it's something that he apparently told the authorities after this, he would return to Jacksonville, Florida, and would shortly thereafter be arrested for stabbing a bartender during a fight. Knowles would pick up, pick the lock on his cell where he was in jail, and he escaped in July of 1974 after, you know, being in there for stabbing a bartender. And so without getting into all of the details of his crime sprees, because this is not Murder Mystery Makeup Monday, I am not Bailey Sarian. 
At any rate, he went on a crime spree. It spanned seven states. And it was after he was a, he had abducted a woman in West Palm Beach and then drove from there to Fort Pierce, he would drop off his hostage unharmed. The next morning, he was spotted in, a, in that stolen vehicle by a highway patrolman who would attempt to arrest Knowles. And Knowles wrestled with the officer, got his pistol from him, and then took the officer hostage, hopped into the patrol car with his hostage, pulled somebody else over, stole that car, and now had two prisoners. Both men would be killed by Knowles. He would eventually be caught in Georgia, where he claimed to have killed 35 people. But police were only ever able to account for 20, which is still too many. So on December 18th, 1974, Sheriff Earl Lee and an agent by the name of Ronnie Angel from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations were traveling with Knowles handcuffed in the back seat on I-20 on their way to Henry County, Georgia. And somehow Knowles was able to gain access access to Sheriff Lee's handgun, discharged it through the holster. He would wrestle with Knowles while trying to maintain control of the vehicle. And then the other officer, Officer Angel, would fire three shots into Knowles' chest, killing him instantly. So all of this begs the question I know you're all asking, but if he was active in 1974, what on earth? What do you have to do with Little Miss P in 1971? Well, that's an excellent question. And the best I could find was that he was on parole in 1971. And I know she was probably killed in December of 1970, maybe January 71. So I don't know how there's a link, but that is a very good question. That outside of some random Reddit posts that I had seen, I could find nothing on to really solidly tie Knowles to Little Miss P. I just thought that I would throw the weird, obscure theory out there in the event that maybe someone really knows the truth about what happened to Miss P and a possible connection to Knowles. What are your thoughts? What do you think? Um, Obviously, I'll leave a link to the unsolved mystery documentary that I had found with the case on it. Probably has a lot more details than what I want to go into on this. You know, I'm trying to, I want you guys to watch my videos. And so I'm trying not to go on forever. But let me know your thoughts on this down in the comments. Like, do you think maybe Knowles could have had something to do with it? What about the guy that was almost run over by the sheriff's patrol that they didn't think anything of? And why would they? They didn't see a body at the time. So I don't know. What do you think? Let me know. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Hit the bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. And until we meet again, I don't know. Watch out for strangers. Bye.